Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first New Economy Live event of 2024, Advancing Economic Reconciliation. My name is Kate Koplovich, Director of Strategy at Calgary Economic Development, and I will be your host and moderator for the next 90 minutes. As always, I'm going to begin this event with a land acknowledgement. I am hosting this webinar from Calgary, or Mokinstis, at the confluence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers. This place is on the traditional Treaty 7 territory and the oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is comprised of the Siksika, Gaina, Begani, as well as the Iahe Nakoda nations comprised of the Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Good Stony First Nations, and the Satina Nation. This territory is also home to the Otepemisawa Metis government and Calgary Nose Hill District 5 and Calgary Elbow District 6. Finally, I acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land and who honor and celebrate this territory. The music we chose to open our event today is a cover of The Beatles with a little help from my friends featuring Medicine Tail Singers by B.B. Buckskin, a Métis Cree artist living in Calgary and originally from Pad Paddle Prairie Métis Settlement. We'll put a link in the chat to her SoundCloud page if you are keen to listen to more of her soulful songs. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. We are thrilled and honored to be creating space to have an important conversation with leaders in our community on economic reconciliation. Over the past three years, Calgary Economic Development has been on a journey to listen and learn about the truth of the history of Indigenous peoples in Canada and is committed to advancing economic reconciliation in our region, and even more than that, committed to moving towards reconciliation. action. One way we have contributed to this conversation was to partner with the City of Calgary and MNP to conduct a quantitative economic analysis of the size of the Indigenous economy in, treaty, in the Treaty 7 region. This research, the Indigenous Economic Contribution Study was released in December of last year and sets a benchmark and identifies opportunities to advance economic participation and socioeconomic outcomes for Indigenous peoples in the Calgary and Treaty 7 regions. The study is publicly available on CED's website in case you'd like to dive into the details of that study. Today's panel discussion will focus on reconciliation and how our community can advance the Indigenous economy in Calgary and the region. For those of you joining us for the first time, the New Economy Live series was created to bring together members of the community of the public to learn about our, our city's economic strategy. The series in this in this the events in these series are free of charge and to make sure that they are accessible to as many people as possible underpinned by the latest research on a topic that's relevant to Calgary and feature truly inspiring speakers and panelists. And given today's panel, panelists, I'm confident we've delivered. The vision of the economic strategy for Calgary is for Calgary to be the place where bright minds and big ideas come together with an unmatched spirit to help solve global challenges. A place that stands out not because we have all the answers, but because we're here to help each other create unexpected possibilities. That's the city we are building together and the strategy is truly our community's strategy. Our event today will begin with a presentation by Susan Mowbray, a consulting partner with MNP who worked with us on the Indigenous Economic Contribution Study to share the results from the study, including its three recommendations. And following Susan's presentation, we will be joined by four incredible panelists from Community Futures Treaty 7, the City of Calgary, Project Reconciliation, and Indigenous Tourism Alberta for a full hour of discussion and audience Q&A. We do have some prepared questions for the panelists, but I'd encourage them to chime in at any time during the discussion to make this not an interview by me, but a discussion uh, between the panelists. For today's event, you can post a question using the Q&A function in Zoom, and we will aim to tackle as many audience questions as we can with the time that we have today. This event also has closed captions that can be accessed via a link, which we will post in the chat. The link will be pinned in the chat so you can access it at any time during the event. And then if you click on the link, the closed captions will, be, will open in a separate browser window. With all of the housekeeping out of the way, I'll introduce Susan Mowbray and we can get this event started. 
Susan is a partner with MNP's consulting practice in Vancouver and leads the national insights and analytics practice. She is an economist with more than 20 years of experience in economic modeling and assessment in various contexts. Susan specializes in developing quantitative estimates to inform decision making and has extensive experience estimating economic impacts and assessing economic contributions. She has worked with Indigenous groups across Canada on economic development and has developed estimates of the economic contributions of Indigenous communities in Alberta, British Columbia, and Manitoba. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Kate. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and so I guess if we can go to the next slide, please. I would like to begin just by acknowledging that the work that we did was very much a collaboration. Um, we had a lot of help, uh, not just from the City of Calgary, uh, and Calgary Economic Development, but from a number of uh, Indigenous organizations and who contributed information and took their time to uh, talk with us as we we're putting the study together. So I want to acknowledge those contributions and a number of them are joining us today on the panel. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I just want to start with just a little bit of, about the report at a high level. Um, and there were really three objectives uh, to the report. The first one was to sort of establish a base baseline and understand where we are and what the opportunities are that can help us uh, you know, work towards economic reconciliation. The other thing is to counter myths and misconceptions, because there's a lot of myths out there about you know, Indigenous people uh, around sort of you know, whether they work, whether they pay taxes, what they get for quote unquote free. Um, and so we really wanted to, to you know, zone in and, and help to counter some of those myths. Uh, that are out there um, that may be contributing to some of the, um, the biases against uh, Indigenous peoples. Uh, and finally, we wanted to profile uh, some of Indigenous organizations and illustrate how Indigenous organizations participate in Alberta's economy and in particular in the Calgary economy. So that's really what the, the, the objectives of the report are and, and sort of what the information contained in the report is intended to do. So if we move to the next page, or slide, thank you. I um, want to start just by talking about the geographic scope. Uh, this study was really built on some work that uh, MNP did with ATB, where we did a, an Alberta-wide study of the Indigenous contributions. And this was really about focusing on Indigenous contributions in Calgary and the Treaty 7 area. And so the geography that we're looking at is defined as Calgary, which includes the Indigenous households and Indigenous businesses in the Calgary metro area. Uh, and it's also what we call Treaty 7 or adjacent to Calgary. And adjacent to Calgary is really about those uh, Treaty 7 nations, the activities that are happening on reserve for them in the area. So when we're looking at, at the numbers, that's what the numbers are representing. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, the first thing is to really understand what and define what the Indigenous economy is. And how we look at the Indigenous economy is how we look at any economy. Um, the first, you know, actor in the uh, uh, economy is households. And so we looked at all Indigenous households and it's the expenditures that are being made by those who identify as Indigenous and live in Calgary and adjacent to Calgary. Uh, the second actor in the Indigenous economy is Indigenous governments. And so here we we're hoping to include uh, the Métis governments as well, but we were not able to get data. So our estimates right now, and this is a gap in, in the estimates that are there, are really based on the expenditures uh, and activities of the band administrations of Treaty 7 First Nations. Uh, and then finally, there's Indigenous businesses. And so what we were looking at is all um, the you know, activities of Indigenous owned businesses operating in Calgary and adjacent to Calgary. So this includes both those uh, businesses that are owned by Treaty 7 First Nations and their members, but also businesses that are owned by other Indigenous people who live uh, in Calgary. So um, that's uh, that's how the Indigenous economy is defined. And, you know, the, it's basically a subset of our larger uh, economy in the Calgary area. If you can move to the next slide, please. The next challenge uh, in doing this is to be able to identify where there's data that is consistent um, and that can be replicated. Because part of this is to establish a baseline and allow progress to be measured going forward. And so we wanted to be able to use data that we knew was um, you know, validated, but we also knew was going to be available in the future. So what we uh, settled on is for Indigenous governments, uh, we use the First Nation financial statements that are published under the financial 
uh, Transparency Act. There's data from Canada Re Revenue, the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, some data from Statistics Canada, uh, also data from Indigenous Services Canada and the Government of Alberta, and finally the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business. And so the data sources that we have give us a pretty good picture of households. They give us a pretty good picture of the Treaty 7 First Nations Administration. Uh, but where one of the big data gaps is, and maybe this is something the panel will address when they talk about it, is with uh, indigenous businesses, there's very little information um, available that's consistent on indigenous businesses. So we know that the numbers here um, only reflect part of the story, that the, that the contribution of indigenous businesses is larger than what is presented in this report. Um, and so going forward, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have better data uh, to be able to estimate the, the size of those contributions. So if we want to go to the next set of slides. Um, let's talk about what the numbers actually show. So the first one we wanted to look at is people, because ultimately all economic activity is about people. So if we look at the Indigenous population, it's about 3.2% of Calgary, uh, Calgary's total population. Uh, most of, you know, the, the largest component of the Indigenous population in the Calgary area is First Nations. Uh, they represent about 65% of the population, uh, and then Métis. Uh, people who identify as Métis are the next largest component. And then finally, we have um, other Indigenous identities. So that would be people who uh, identify as Innu or who have multiple Indigenous um, identities. So it's about, as I say, 3.2% of Calgary's population. That kind of gives us a benchmark. If we know it's 3.2% of the population, we kind of expect 3.2% of economic activity. And so as we go through, we'll see whether that is the case. And it will tell us where some of the gaps are. So if we want to go on to the next slide. Um, one of the other interesting things about uh, the Indigenous population versus the non-Indigenous population is the age distribution. And so if you look at the, uh, the age distribution, what we see is the Indigenous population is definitely younger than the non-Indigenous population. We have a significantly larger share of the population that's under 24 years of age. And I think when I see that, that represents an opportunity for me. Um, I, I see that there's huge opportunities there for uh, you know, us to make difference, help make differences in the lives of Indigenous people by looking at you know, education and you know, creating more opportunities for participation in the broader economy for those young people um, on it. So it's definitely a, a, a great opportunity given the differences in the age distribution. And if we wanna to go to the next. Okay. And so if we look at what the, the contribution is in the spending, um, I always love to look at these numbers because this is the first myth that I find busted. So uh, our estimate is that households in Calgary and adjacent to Calgary um, spend about $1.3 billion annually um, on goods and services. And they're buying those from both non-Indigenous businesses, but also from Indigenous businesses. Uh, about 70%, on 69, almost 70% of that spending is from wages and salaries. Uh, from employment at non-Indigenous organizations. Another 15% is through employment at um, First Nations governments. So together, you're looking at about almost 85% of the income of First Nation, or of Indigenous households is generated from employment. That's not that different from non-Indigenous households. So yes, Indigenous people do work and they are making contributions not just to Indigenous governments and Indigenous business, but to the non-Indigenous uh, non businesses as well. So if we want to go to the next thing, um, this is the First Nations government. So as I said, we didn't have information on Métis government expenditure. So this number is a little bit smaller than uh, what it would be if we had had that in the area. And here again, um, I, I find this, this really interesting. So the first uh, Treaty 7 First Nations government spent about almost $600 million a year uh, on goods and services uh, and um, different programs for not just for their communities, but they're buying those goods and services to support their communities. Uh, about 365 million of that is on goods and services, and a significant amount of that is spent on, uh, the, that spent expenditure on goods and services goes to non-Indigenous businesses. Uh, there's about $190 million of labor income, and about $35 million that's being spent on social assistance. So once again, a substantial contribution to the economy, um, you know, and contributing not just to Indigenous the indigenous economy, but to the broader economy in Alberta. If you want to go to the next slide, please. 
Um, now, if we look at indigenous owned business revenues, and this is, as I say, this is, we know that this number is too small. Uh, we did our best to be able to come up with information, but the data is very limited on what it is. Uh, of that, another, you know, $552 million of spending by indigenous um, or owned businesses. Of that, about 329 is in the city of Calgary. So those are indigenous businesses that are operating in the city of Calgary. Approximately 184 million is for Treaty 7 nation owned businesses. So that would be uh, the businesses that are part of the Economic Development Corps uh, or that are owned by the uh, nation themselves. And then there's another 39 million that was estimated uh, to be revenue associated with indigenous owned or businesses owned by um, uh, Treaty 7 nations that are operating on reserves. So that's how we got to the 552 million. Um, so what does that all mean? If we go to the next slide, we can see what uh, that looks like from um, an Indigenous versus non-Indigenous business perspective. And this is another area where I see huge amounts of opportunity. Uh, it shows the distribution of Indigenous businesses by sector, and it compares it with what that distribution looks like in Calgary in, in general. And so what you see is Indigenous owned businesses tend to be um, have relatively higher representation in natural resource industries, in construction, in hospitality and recreation. Um, and to some degree uh, in professional services. And some of the reasons for that is there's a couple of things around the natural resources. There's been a long time uh, requirement for indigenous procurement and then, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, natural resource extraction requires as part of, you know, the environmental assessment process and um, approvals that there's indigenous participation and so that's influenced that um, the other thing that really stands out to me is is in the support services so this is where we see retail whole, wholesale real estate and insurance and financial financial services indigenous owned businesses are really underrepresented and those sectors are sectors that create a lot of wealth so we've heard all about real estate uh, and, and you know, those the insurance and the financial services and the contributions they make, those are, are huge wealth generators that really have low representation for Indigenous. So once again, here I see huge amounts of opportunity. And now if we go to the next slide, um, if we total it all together, what this looks like in terms of the total economic uh, contribution of Indigenous peoples in Calgary, uh, we're looking at about almost $3 billion in output annually. Uh, one and a half billion in GDP, almost uh, you know, a, almost a billion dollars in labor income, and uh, taxes of over uh, almost three hundred thousand. So, so three sorry three hundred million. Um, so yes, indigenous uh, businesses, indigenous households, and uh, indigenous governments do pay taxes. Uh, in terms of total employment, um, it generates about twelve hundred. 12,800 FTEs, that's total employment. Um, it's important to note that that's not the employment of uh, Indigenous health, like Indigenous people, that is the spending, that's the amount of um, employment that's supported by the spending. So it's a mix of Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people uh, that would be in those jobs. And it's a reflection of the contribution to the broader economy. Um, so those are some pretty big numbers, but it's always interesting to know how they compare. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll look at some comparisons in the next one, please. Comparing um, the contribution of the Indigenous economy to the city of Calgary's total GDP, it's about 1.5%, uh, or sorry, 1.2% of Calgary's GDP. And if you remember, I said the population was about 3.2% of Calgary, that represents a gap. And part of why we have that gap is that distribution uh, to some degree of businesses, but also the distribution of employment. A lot of the businesses that um, indigenous uh, that are indigenous owned may not be in sort of those higher value sectors, and so that's that that difference between the contribution of indigenous people to the Calgary economy and its share of the population tells us that you know there's a gap that can be closed there. And once again, that represents an opportunity. Um, if we look at the total employment that's supported by indigenous expenditures, it's about 32 percent of the total employment in Calgary's tech sector in 2021. So that's one of those high value sectors. And so it's, it's about a third, it's about a third as big as the uh, uh, tech sector. So this is kind of, I always find it interesting to do these comparisons. We also looked at some comparisons about income and employment. So if we wanna to go to the next 
slide. Um, here again, you start to see some opportunity. What I see is some gaps and some where, where there's some opportunities. And so, if you look at uh, the median income uh, for uh, non-indigenous people in the Calgary area, it's about forty-five thousand uh, as of the last census. So that was in twenty twenty-one. Um, for Métis people, it's about forty-one. So there's a there's there. But if we start to look at First Nations, it's not about thirty-six. So there's some big gaps between the median income for First Nations and AT as a non-Indigenous identity. Um, and if you see, you see similar things when you look at employment rates. So for non-Indigenous identity, uh, the employment rate is about six, almost 61%. For Métis people, it's similar. Um, but if you look back at that median income, if the, med if the median income is still lower, that there's a, a difference in the distribution of employment. So maybe those jobs aren't in uh, some of those higher value occupations, or maybe they're not as senior. So there's that, that, if you look at those two things together, you start to see that there's an opportunity. And then when we look at First Nations, what we see is that it's even lower. There's a 10 point gap between um, employment rates for First Nations and employment rates for non-Indigenous uh, and Métis. So there's another opportunity to be looking at how can we um, provide opportunities for employment for First Nations. Um, and it comes back to that story that I was talking about with the population and that relatively younger population. We've heard a lot about labor shortages um, and you know, where, where did everybody go? Well, part of that is retirements. And as our population ages, you know, the people that are younger are going to play, a, you know, there's going to be more opportunities for them. So as those opportunities come forward, we, you know, there's a, a great way to help to close some of these gaps by making sure that indigenous uh, indigenous youth get access to those opportunities. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so based on looking at all this, we came up with uh, the three recommendations and the panel, I think we'll dive a little bit more deeper into these. The first one is to support collaborate with the city and its current development and implementation of an indigenous procurement program. As I said, in the resource sector, we've seen a lot of success in you know, developing capacity and you know, growth in Indigenous businesses through the procurement policies. Uh, another one is to work with the Blackfoot Confederacy Nations, Satina, Stony Nakoda, Métis and Urban Indigenous Economic Development Organizations to enhance program offerings and support for Indigenous businesses, because there are a lot of barriers that are faced by Indigenous businesses that aren't necessarily um, the same as non-Indigenous businesses. And finally, as one, uh, one of the recommendations was around uh, tourism, and it was to attract Indigenous meetings and events. And so that is uh, summarized. I just want to go to the next slide and say thank you for the opportunity to talk about the work that we did. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back to you, Kate. Thanks so much for the presentation, Susan. I really appreciate you going into that detail about the results and the recommendations from the study. I'm excited to dig into the results and, and the research with the panelists who I'll introduce to you to everyone now. Our first panelist is Shauna Morningbull, Manager of Business Development at Community Futures Treaty 7. Shauna Morningbull, whose traditional name is Igana Sapistigomi, which in English means low owl hoot woman, and by the way, Shauna tells me that in order to say that name correctly, I have to say it 400 times, and that was my first time, so I'll get better. <laughs> she is from the Seldom Lonesome Clan and is a member of the Bigani First Nation, which is part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. She is presently employed as the Manager of Business Development at Community Futures Treaty 7 here in Calgary and has been for the past 13 years. Prior to this, she was the business loans manager with the in Alberta Indian Investment Corporation and a business support officer with the Indian Business Corporation. But her career in business began with the Peace Hills Trust in 1997. She has attended Lethbridge College for Business Management and Criminal Justice, and in June 2022, attended Harvard Business School and completed a one-week leadership program there. Shauna was on the Bigani Resource Development Limited Board of Directors from August 2011 to January 2020, an entity operating on her homelands of the Bigani Nation to develop, design, and implement projects, programs, and services for the benefit of her First Nation economy. Shauna was also on the Board of Directors of CANDU as the Alberta representative from 2013 to 2022. Shauna is the 2018 recipient of the Chief David Crowchild Award. Um, she was presented this award by Mayor Nenshi in June 2018 for her efforts to build bridges in and around Calgary between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and entities. 
Shauna is married to Wade, and together they have five children and seven grandchildren. She enjoys attending her children's activities, such as college basketball, hockey, mixed martial arts, wrestling, and they all enjoy hitting the powwow trail where Shauna is a traditional dancer. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Shauna, given how busy your schedule must be with all of those activities. Next, I want to introduce Harold Horsfall, an Indigenous Relations Strategist with the Indigenous Relations Office at the City of Calgary. Harold is an individual driven by passion for advancing the exceptionally large goal of creating truth and reconciliation. He currently manages two projects, the Indian Residential School Memorial Project and an Indigenous Heat Map Project. Harold has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Calgary and a master's degree in global management from Royal Roads University Faculty of Business. Harold is currently preparing to write the project management professional exam. And a fun fact about Harold is that he is a, just a few courses short of an undergraduate degree in philosophy. Harold embraces challenge and he believes in economic reconciliation and will not be satisfied until Calgary is a livable city for all its citizens, including Indigenous peoples. The best possible future in Harold's eyes is a future where reconciliation is just the way we do things. Welcome, Harold. Thanks for being with us today. Next, I'd like to introduce Michelle Goodkey. Michelle is the Vice President of External Relations at Project Reconciliation. She's a seasoned professional with over 20 years of experience in bridging cultural differences to develop natural resources in Canada. As the Vice President of, Econo of External Relations and Chief Sustainability Officer at Project Reconciliation's Reconciliation Energy Transition, Inc., she plays a crucial role in establishing material Indigenous ownership in low-carbon energy transition projects. With a bachelor's degree in natural resource management and forestry, Michelle was previously the Manager of Indigenous and Stakeholder Relations at Interpipeline. Her experience in sustainability, community relations, consultation, government relations, and policy, and policy shifts, combined with her strong networks within provincial governments and Indigenous communities, makes her an asset. Michelle's career highlights include successfully navigating complex projects, streamlining stakeholder engagement, and initiating Indigenous economic opportunities. She is also the Managing Director of Good Synergies, an Indigenous and Stakeholder Engagement Consultancy. Thanks so much for welcoming or for joining us today, Michelle. And finally, we have Brenda Holder, board chair of Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Brenda is of Cree Iroquois lineage and is pleased to follow her heritage as a traditional guide from the Quara Quante um, of Jasper. She is a traditional knowledge keeper of plant medicine from her Cree lineage and teaches courses on plant medicine offers unique and fun hands-on workshops on plants and their medicines, as well as doing fascinating walks into the boreal forest to explore the amazing medicines on display. She is the vice chair for the um, Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and is chair of Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Um, and she was recently appointed to the board of Destination Canada. Brenda has been the recipient of several prestigious awards for her work in using her company to share her Indigenous culture. Some of these awards include the um, Aboriginal Women Entrepreneur Award of Distinction from the Alberta Chamber of Commerce and the ESCOW Award from the Institute for Advancement of Aboriginal Women. I feel like we had all of our panelists moments ago. So potentially, I would love if they could all bring their cameras back up um, and we can get the discussion going and we can jump right in. So after seeing the results of the study, was there anything that stood out to any of you from the presentation that you wanted to dig into just a bit more? I'll start. Um, so I would, the, during the study, um, Community Futures, you know, was, was a part, a part of it. And um, one of the things was, there's a uh, like the key the key things that came on. Hold on a second. The key findings, and one was um, you know honoring the truths of reconciliation for the future. You know we had mentioned you had mentioned that you know going from reconciliation to reconciliation, and Chief Willie Littlechild actually coined that phrase reconciliation like uh, like a while a while back, and you know. Um, Oftentimes I've been heard that we're still in that truth, 
we're still, you know, figuring out the truth of, you know, what's, what's happened. And, you know, and this is what the study that took place, the key findings was, you know, uncovering the truths of what's happened, you know, what our First Nations look like, what are, you know, First Nations people. And some of the key findings is, um, you know, like identifying the systematic barriers, um, you know, and that the, the representation of, um, during the Susan's presentation of indigenous businesses that are underrepresented, and that could very well be that, you know, oftentimes, you know, maybe they don't know, they have to go register their business, maybe they don't know. And so at Community Futures 27, you know, we do workshops and our, the very first, I, when I get on this, you know, when I'm, I'm there and I'm going to present, the first things I tell them is one, is if you own a business and you're having to supplement it with additional income, all you have is an expensive hobby. Two, if you're making money and you have to pay taxes, that's okay. If you're paying taxes, it means you're making money. And it's, that's what we want. We want to be affluent and we want to make money, right? And then three is um, all you have is your reputation. When you're in business, all you have is your reputation. So those are the kind of the three things that we go out there. So yes, I can see that some of the businesses are up underrepresented, especially the artisans, but there are so many markets that go on that artisans attend. There's so many, you know, like Satina, just before Christmas, Satina had a big market, you know, out at the sportsplex. And I think there was, they said something like almost 500 vendors there. And I was there for three hours and I think I barely got through half, half of the, because I had to go to my daughter's, um, she's now an alumni basketball player with, she had a state game, but, um, you know, so that that's, you know, and those are the things I guess with, with asking questions and with, um, you know, just getting that knowledge out there and, you know, just bringing the knowledge out there too, that, you know, we'll find those gaps. We'll start to fill those gaps. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna. Fantastic. Any others want to dig into um, into the presentation a little bit more? Sure, I can. Uh, I can have a go at it. Um, yeah. So, like from the city of Calgary, it was great to work with uh, CED on putting together this report. Um, so, uh, uh, hearing the presentation, uh, it was great, and uh, and thank you, Susan, for putting that together. It was very informative, and and the thing that still strikes me are the gaps. Um, and just being cognizant. And that I think that's the best part of the report is like it puts those gaps front and center uh, so that people are aware of them. Because if we don't know there are any, any challenges, if we don't know that there are any gaps and we can't like quantify them uh, or qualify them, it's like, well, what's going on here? What is the story? And I think that's really good. Uh, so I work with the Indigenous Relations Office with the city of Calgary and it's relatively young and it's still growing. Um, so, but up to now, up to this point, very little work has been focused on economic reconciliation. And uh, I think the best part of this report and, and especially as an indigenous householder living here in the Calgary and Treaty 7 area, um, you know, I think that's, that's really good that we start addressing those gaps. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Harold. Brenda. Um, yeah, I wanted to just maybe um, piggyback a little bit on what um, Shauna had been discussing in terms of um, how it relates for me, how it relates to the recommendations that were shown on the uh, on the final slide. Um, and uh, and that is the uh, the marketing of, uh, of, of special events. And um, and I believe that that Shauna is absolutely correct. You know, there is um, there is um, such a. Uh, uh, a valuable wealth of amazing, talented um, artisans um, that can certainly um, be a part of the uh, the economy boost as well. Um, but I would also say too that there's, um, you know, in terms of the gaps, there is as wonderful as it is to have the artisans present, and and they really are such an important part of it. Um, from a tourism perspective, there are far more opportunities that um, could be explored in that way as well. Um, you know, people uh, people sharing their knowledge of uh, of the Calgary area, taking people for walks, and really beginning to uh, share the story of Indigenous people as well. So um, I think that's something that uh, that should be explored a little bit more in depth as well. 
It's a great contribution. I really appreciate your point about sharing stories of the of the region. Absolutely. Michelle. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks everyone for adding in there. I just to add on for the gaps piece and all the fact that there actually is this study. Like let's just acknowledge that alone. Like this to even happen is a huge step forward. So that's one thing I wanted to, to acknowledge. One thing that really stand out for me was the youth um, percentages of growing, like the, the relatively fast growth of the youth, youth, youthful population of the Indigenous people. And with approximately 42% of the Indigenous population under 25, that momentum, that um, the momentum of that population, the advancement, especially non-Indigenous populations that are aging, we fill those gaps in the market. So there's an opportunity now to get all these youth involved in not just in an industry, but in, con in construction and artisans and all these other things that are out there for filling those gaps and to learn about business. Like how many kids don't know anything about business? Like I, I learned as I got as an adult, not as a child. So there's so much more opportunities there. And especially as we get into the energy transition economy, there's going to be so much more need for skilled trades and lots of skilled employment that'll actually bring more prosperity to the communities and we'll keep growing from that as well. That's fantastic. I completely agree when we think about the the workforce um, that, you know, the, the challenges that we see today, um, there's a huge opportunity to, um, yeah, to bring that forward. Shauna, do you have anything you want to um, Just, just quickly to adding about the youth and, and things of that nature. Um, my two daughters and my stepson have both taken the junior achievement programs at their schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so my, my stepson, he, you know, would learn the concept of as soon as the snow fell, he was out there shoveling, you know, making money and then had, you know, told his buddy to join him. Then his buddy started, became his competition. And then he knew better after that. Right. So that all stemmed from junior achievement. My daughter, you know, was a part of junior achievement. And she said she was going to be a plumber because plumbers made more money than doctors. And I said, okay, we'll go fix the toilet. And she was like, no, thanks. So she decided, you know, my youngest one, who is now she's 14, special needs, she's nonverbal. But you know what, she did the junior achievement lemonade day. And, you know, she had a lemonade, my husband built her lemonade stand, and she had lemonade sold out. And then, you know, we got went and got more lemonade, went to a barbecue, set up her lemonade stand and she started to hustle family. So they, they weren't going to have free lemonade at the barbecue. They had to pay, you know. And now, you know, she has this little side hustle where she does Nike tie dye socks. And, you know, so here's somebody who, you know, you know, did the did the whole we did the whole online lemonade day thing and you know what, and she knows the concept of money. So I'm a big believer in junior achievement. So those out there, you know, if the junior achievement program goes to your school for one afternoon, a day, whatever, you know what, get your kids in there, because they'd learn that concept. That's such a great point about like really the, the potential and, and having that program and those types of supports really can motivate and and teach kids about business which is fantastic that's amazing what a great story oh my gosh I love that Nike tie-dye socks um I want to take a little bit of a step back maybe um and and ask really you know we talk about reconciliation and everything and then there's a second term economic reconciliation right and so um I want to go through again a bit of a, a, a circle here of what does economic reconciliation mean to you and what does it look like in practice in your um in your organization and maybe I'll uh, I'll start with Brenda for this one yeah absolutely you know I've um spent numerous years really since um, around 2005 um, training um, many Indigenous people to um, to engage in tourism and one of the things that I guess I kind of bumped up against sometimes was something that I I guess I like to refer to as money wounds and the difficulty that um, sometimes people would have in in um, you know, in earning money and um, and and how hard that could be sometimes. Um, sometimes it's intimidating to earn a, a lot of money and to, to really try and um, understand how to um, 
how to charge for things that were, you know, naturally part of our culture or natural gifts that people would have in terms of their, their storytelling and those sorts of contributions. And, um, and I really, I guess I really recognize that within the tourism industry specifically, there was such a disconnect and there were definitely some gaps there in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we work with these so-called money wounds that we have, but also help people to move to a space of prosperity? And you know, through a number of years, there there was a, a lot of um, a lot of learning from my own perspective. Of course, I I had to deal with my own money wounds. I had to understand that as well. And so, one of the things that um, I learned along the way which a great friend of mine, um, David Daly from Wapask Adventures put into wonderful words for me, is he said, you know, I guess one of the things that we, we have to really recognize is that when we think about money and we think about sometimes the shame or the, the fear around it is that we have to simply consider it just going right back to basics that this is just simply a new form of a, of a different beaver pelt. We're just working with a different beaver pelt. And you know, it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, although that's really quite a metaphor, it helped me to really understand that I also had to take a step back and really recognize that for us as Indigenous people to, um, to, to thrive in, and to create uh, a solid economy for ourselves, we had to approach this from a cultural way that not only made sense to us, but also feels good to us. And so I went on quite a deep dive of, of exploring that and, um, and really trying to take it apart to see what does that mean to us? Because even for myself, I didn't quite, I didn't quite know that. And so over the years, as, I, as I've begun to develop uh, myself in uh, uh, understanding um, how economy fits uh, within people with, who have money wounds, I really realized um, how different uh, tourism in terms of Indigenous people um, really impacts the economy and that we have such a strong opportunity to not only heal those money wounds, but be enormous contributors um, in, in, the, uh, in the financial, in, in the GDP. And one thing I just kind of want to say is, is a little bit of an aside is that from uh, ITAC, the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, much of the data that we um, that we have collected in terms of um, uh, Indigenous people in tourism is the massive number of those who wanted to become entrepreneurs. And what needs to be shouted from the roof rooftops is 30% of those are women. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 it, it warms my heart to see that. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, that data point and also for sharing your, those um, thoughts around that, you know, those money wounds and, and really overcoming that challenge even before you can participate in the economy, which is, is really insightful. And I really appreciate that metaphor as well. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, maybe we'll go to uh, Shauna next. So what reconcili what reconciliation is to me is, um, you know, the, I guess really, you know, is um, it starts in our home. I believe it starts like going, you know, going back to my, about the junior achievement. Mm -hmm. And it's about, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of residential school. Although I didn't go to residential school, my grandparents, my, my dad did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, growing up, you know, on, with a parent who went to residential school was um, there was a lot of things that went on. But one of the things I remember when I was 18 and I was going to college and, you know, my dad had me hooked up with his you know, credit card kind of thing under his, so he was the holder. And then I had a, I had a credit card and I had a limit and that was for emergencies, right? So that money management began then. So then that went to me. And so, you know, my, you know, my, my special needs girl has a bank account. She has a card, you know, her classroom, there's 10 of them. They went for a walk 
to uh, Subway. And because Callie had her own bank card, they all had money. They brought $5 to buy their subs. And Callie had her own bank card. So they got her to be last so that she could tap, so that she could show her peers how to tap. And apparently the the kids just cheered for her, you know, they just thought she was just amazing. And, and so, you know, the teacher and I had that conversation and she was like, it's so amazing what you've done for Callie. And I'm like, she's my daughter and I'm gonna, not going to treat her any different. So she's learned the same, you know, lessons that, that I would have learned my older daughter, my stepkids. And, you know, so my older daughter, she's one time during COVID, my nephew was over, he had, his, his internet was bad. And so he had to use mine and so he's sitting at the table and there's my daughter getting ready to go to, go to work. And he tells her, Mason, are you making lunch for work? And Mason looks at him and says, that's how you stay rich. And I just kind of like laughed. And I thought, you know what, you know, she knows the, you know, to save money, right? And man, does she have does she have quite the little uh, savings going? You know, she works at Atco, and she just got a she just got a promotion, and she's like, you know what, mom? I hope that the housing price comes down because I want to buy a home. I have a down payment, and I'm like, so those are the things that it it the harm that was done, you know, to you know our people you know, is, is sad in, in terms of, you know, that this systematic disempowerment. But I think through the teaching, and as Brenda had mentioned, you know, she's been, you know, teaching, you know, about tourism since 2005, when she was 13, you know, that, you know, that that's what, there's a lot of organizations and people out there that genuinely have that, you know, to that, that, that need not need, but that um, you know, in them um, to teach people. And I guess that's you know when I teach entrepreneur pro workshops, and you know, you know that's one of the things you know as I talk about is it's okay to make money. Mm-hmm. And you know what? There's lots of programs out there that can help you to save money to, you know, make sure that you have a savings plan. So I think it starts in the home. I think, you know, that money management starts in the home. Um, But you know what, people don't know what they don't know, right? So once that education gets out there and, you know, you know, things will, that balance will then, that, that economic balance and equality for, you know, indigenous people will, you know, will follow suit. But just like everything, you can't lead a horse to water and make them drink, you know, they have to want it. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Shauna. Um, Harold, what does economic reconciliation mean to you? And what does it look like in practice at the city of Calgary? Excellent, thank you, Kate. Um, Mm -hmm. Before that, I saw a a question in the chat about indigenous procurement and uh, the city of Calgary having targets. Um, That is, is you jumped a gun. So if I could just press pause on that question, we will come back to it because I do have some messaging from our, from my uh, colleagues in supply management. Uh, But jumping to economic reconciliation, what does it mean to me? I see economic reconciliation as one of the pillars of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. On my personal reading of the TRC calls to action, uh, a good majority of them deal with equity. And, and so things like the gap, the, uh, the uh, median income gap that's shown in our report, you know, that could definitely easily be a target. I think if that was a target and, uh, and there was a lot more, we could have equitable incomes, uh, that would definitely go up the chain of economic reconciliation and satisfy many of the truth and reconciliation commission calls to action. Um, and, I, and I think like, you know, going deeper down into economic reconciliation of its own accord, uh, that it can be broken down into two parts really. And, and part of it is what we've done here. We're uh, compiling existing data and uh, to help paint the picture of the economic reality that faces Indigenous people mm-hmm. in the city of Calgary. Um, and if that data is not available, maybe create a baseline report um, to, uh, to, you know, a, a groundbreaking 
uh, trailblazing report, like the one that, uh, that's been created here, to bring that data to the surface so that we can work on it, so that there can be actionable things. And, and Susan talked about uh, gaps, and that would be it. With that data, or if there's a lack of data, go out and get it. But then with that data, uh, do things like uh, look into the toolbox, the analysis toolbox, like doing things like gap analysis and making sure that we create a plan that has good actionable goals and then implementing those plans. Everybody has a plan. And, and this is even from uh, taking my lead from uh, Mayor Gondek. Everybody has a plan, but it's only as good, like everybody can have a strategy, but it's only as good as it is when it's implemented. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I get that quote to uh, Mayor Gondek. Uh, there are very, um, yeah, yeah, I think that covers a lot, um, you know, and the one thing that I thought was really neat that maybe we could even hear more from Susan about is the multiplier that was given in the report is I think that mm -hmm. is definitely one of the tools in the toolbox that can help bridge those gaps. So thank you. Thanks, Harold. And finally, Michelle, what does rec economic reconciliation mean to you and what does it look like in practice at Project Reconciliation? Thank you for that question. Um, and I'm just going to add on to everything else our written colleagues said on the panel. There are great points. Um, I'm going to take it a, a level up from the on the ground for sure. Um, but economic reconciliation is to me is the path forward to reconciliation. So it is you need economic sovereignty to actually have a path forward, have choices on what you want to do. And that is especially when it comes to the indigenous communities having equity in projects or building businesses. For communities and for the for the community members is having access to capital. If you don't have access to capital, you can't get a loan. You can't move forward on growing a business, and that is really where reconciliation is. Economic reconciliation is moving towards is moving that disparity, the moving from managing poverty to managing wealth. So that's what it means to me. And personally, what it means to me also as well is the, the lack of the the need to have someone in industry to find a way to maneuver through the procurement process, the business development process, where it's part of the culture of industry. So that we're a long way from that, but we're still moving towards it. It's better than it was 20, 30 years ago, but there's still a long way to go. At Project Reconciliation, um, the initiative, the idea is to grow that capital from taking you know, the community's cash flow from projects and then and pooling it together with other communities to grow indigenous capital so then communities don't have to go hat in hand to industry, to government. There will be no need to actually always depend on other people or other organizations to grow the economies. It's already self-sufficient for self-governance and self-reliance. So that's, in a nutshell, the higher purpose of, of economic regulation in a bigger picture with everything else that everyone's been talking about on the ground and procurement and, and, and just education and awareness. So that's what it means. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. No, that, that, that really kind of lot, that's such a, a, an ambitious lofty. I, I love that about the organization that, that you work for a project reconciliation and like how um, aspirational the, the work that, that you do it, that, that your team does. And then really making it happen is, is really, is fantastic. And it's inspiring. Um, I do, you know, we talked a lot about data gaps and Susan mentioned it in her presentation and, um, and I want to ask this of, of anyone who, who wants to respond and I'll, I'll leave it open to any of the panelists here. So we, we talked a lot about the report or the, the data gaps in the report, right? And, and it's essential. We have to have data if we're going to understand the current landscape, exactly like Harold said, right? We need to know the economic reality of, of what's going on in Calgary right now. So I'm interested and, and again, open to any of the panelists. What are the challenges Indigenous businesses and nations face in collecting and maintaining the data about their economy and their businesses? Um, open to anyone. Yeah, Brenda, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so just... For me, I think about this, um, and again, just primarily from a tourism perspective, I think about this as a, you got to spend money to make money sometimes. And so, so sometimes the, um, from a tourism perspective, it's um, utilizing um, more technical equipment, for example, determining where are my guests coming from, who are my guests. So having the technology to be able to um, assist with, with that type of process. And then also, you know, I know this is specific to Calgary, but I mean, really 
um, in Alberta, in some of our rural locations, that's pretty challenging to even, you know, to even get uh, get internet. So, so for me, there's a lot of barriers around technology, um, and there's there's many others, but those are the ones that um, I would currently highlight. Very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I a lot of the the First Nations and Indigenous communities across Canada are are remote. So yeah, having that technology availability, that's a really great point. Um, any other? Yeah, Shauna. I just want to echo Brenda, and and it is true. And so a lot of the First Nations are, um, you know, they don't have one the funding because. To, to even implement or update or whatever, unless they have own source revenues, you know, can afford to even have, you know, a, a telecom type, you know, um, department in their communities. So the, so that's the, a lot of like, what of the barrier is just even internet, you know, having, having the internet in, in the communities and a lot, and then even a lot of the buildings that are built on the First Nations um, are maybe old and they're, you know, the internet is kind of shaky in those places. So it's just the funding, you know, funding is a barrier just to even get to that point to have, you know, good, good internet services. Yeah, that's a great, a great addition as well, for sure. Oh, thanks for that, Shauna. Um, great. Well, I'm, I see that there's actually um, a few questions um, for Harold about the um, City of Calgary um, procurement, uh, you know, program. So why don't we jump right? I'll ask Harold to, to explain, you know, the City of Calgary's Indigenous procurement strategy. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, that's awesome. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I just have one little thing to say on the the data and collecting that data and the sensitive, yeah, fantastic. and then and then and then I'll get I'll go I'll go back to that as per your direction. Um, so there's a lot of challenges involved with uh, collecting Indigenous people's quantitative data. Um, I think it's always best to look for those win-win solutions. Uh, we don't want to take Indigenous data, like say say hypothetically, say you could, uh, if you took Indigenous data and then used it, and then Indigenous people had no no return. Well, that's not equitable. And that's the whole purpose of truth and reconciliation, economic reconciliation to be equitable. So I think making it in terms of win-win um, and then even then adding to that, like going into taking it from an abstract idea and into real, real terms, um, you know, looking into OCAP. Uh, so the ownership control, um, ownership control, uh, access and possession of the data. And th there already is an organization out there. And, and uh, in my own heat map project, I am uh, in the midst of uh, looking into scoping out how it would look to create or implement OCAP friendly principles, if not OCAP principles outright. Uh, so then moving into the key messages from my friends in procurement. Um, so essentially, um, any talk of like targets, uh, this is just like from from the, the conversation and forming talks. Any talk of targets, uh, targets could be seen as a short term thing. Um, I have a, the our procurement uh, department is very committed to long term solutions uh, and understanding and building Indigenous people's capacity within the city. And and that's part of what the Indigenous Procurement Working Group that's been formed and looking into procurement is working on. And it's made up of representatives from uh, Calgary's Indigenous communities, uh, Calgary and areas Indigenous communities and uh, they were formed to provide input advice recommendations all based on lived experiences from those indigenous people living in and around calgary in today's world um so and they meet multiple times between uh november 20 uh, 2023 and june 2024 uh they're also looking at creating an input questionnaire to ask specific questions to indigenous business owners professionals and individuals who are interested in becoming a supplier to the city it's still in development, uh, but uh, keep 
keep in tune to the City of Calgary's procurement website as updates will be submitted there. There's an engage page uh, that has all of their data and uh, keep looking and they're looking to update on the questionnaire in February 2024. Um, and they also want to build relationships and directly connect with Indigenous owned businesses um, to hear more on those lived experiences and to gather input on how the City of Calgary can continue to evolve a more equitable and accessible procurement process. Uh, because that, as I mentioned before, the city is committed to facilitating ongoing conversations to continuously improve the Indigenous procurement program. I hope that's that's probably not going to wet. That's probably only going to wet people's appetites, but uh, that's what I'll have to do for now. <laughs> Thanks so much for that explanation, Harold. Really, really appreciate you sharing more about the Indigenous procurement strategy that's being built. That's fantastic. I do want to give uh, Michelle an opportunity to answer the question about um, data challenges if if you've got anything to add as well. I think it's pretty much been covered, but again, the main focus is funding, finding the money. So yeah. if you have money, you can figure out the solution on that because with technology, it's time and none of that comes for free. So I think we covered it pretty good here already. Fantastic. Um, Shauna, I, I have a question for you. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, or a, a bit about already some challenges, but um, kind of a pointed question to you. What do businesses, Indigenous businesses, need most to be successful? You know, if you're going to give us kind of the top one, two, or three pieces or challenges that, that you're seeing with your, with the, the businesses that you work with. Um, well, one is education on how to run a business. You could be an expert plumber but do you have that understanding on how to run a business right so having those that education on how how to run how to run businesses um and again educating them on um you know financial literacy also instruments to help your business with with um you know to to uh you know, file, do your accounting, you know, all bookkeeping, all of that good stuff, right? Um, you know, and another is, you know, the hustle, marketing, getting out there, you know, getting up with the birds, getting your business out there, you know, because, you know, if you don't have clients, you don't have a business, right? And, and so I, you know, and that that's been my experience. And I've owned Four businesses. I currently own a um, fencing company, and you know I own the fencing company, but my husband is my employer, and you know get that. You know, and and I'm Blackfoot and he's Cree, so we're tradition already traditional enemies, right? Six years later, we you know we're still doing something right, and you know although sometimes I want to trade him in, but you know what? That's beside the point. But you know what? It's educating. It's educating. And and he knows, don't even try to book. Don't even try to quote. Don't even try. Just get it done. I'll do the financial component of it. So if we are finding out what part you do best. And and so we learn, so we come, we come back and we have what is what is called the uh Treaty 7 resource group. And that group we work together and it's industry and it's private and it's you know, the First Nations communities, the economic development organizations, and we all come together to help the, you know, individual entrepreneurs, you know, to, to be better and get out there and, you know, you know, you know, be successful. Um, you know, right now we have uh, Native Diva Creations, you know, all, there was like, there was quite a few of us, you know, um, uh, organizations, you know, that, that helped her yesterday or this Friday was, um, was, was 8,000 us due so that she could, cause she was one of two, um, um, designers selected to the New York fashion week made in Canada, um, you know, to showcase. And so there was a few of us that all worked together. And yesterday she paid that 8,000 you know, so that she could go down. Now she just has to hustle to get airfare and hotels and, you know, all that good stuff. But we all work together, you know, to say, hey, you know what, there's this available, this available. And so that's what we do. 
you know, is it's, you know, we don't, we like, we're starting to, we're not in competition. We're working together to help that entrepreneur. And that's what that resource group, you know, is about. And, you know, Malreen texted me last night and she was so thankful. And I said, you're the product. It was just us believing in you to say, hey, you know what? You're one of two that was selected to attend this. They're taking five, three had to apply. Well, you know what? You you worked your butt off to get to this point. So we have that resource group, you know, that that's there and reaching out to help. We've showcased over 300 entrepreneurs in Treaty 7 area. You know, now people are saying, how do we get to that conference where you where you uh, you're showcasing these entrepreneurs? You know, I want my business. And so that's how they're coming out, you know, and that's how, you know, and then getting that, you know, that that I guess we could work together to say, hey, you know what? But entrepreneurs are so busy, you know, to make that time to fill out forms and whatever, then they need to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic answer. Shauna, absolutely. That's really great. And that resource group sounds amazing. What a what a great, yeah, resource. Fabulous. Uh, Michelle, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain how Project Reconciliation and Reconciliation, reconciliation Energy Transition, um, you know, establishes a foundation to grow inclusive Indigenous intergenerational wealth. You talk about access to capital, you know, you've, you've used the term Indigenous equity um, and ownership. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about your organization um, and, yeah. and how you do that. Yeah. Well, instead of saying Reconciliation Energy Transition Inc., just call it RETI, or RETI, easier. Perfect. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, so Project Reconciliation itself is an initiative or a vision for economic reconciliation on basically creating a fund, like Indigenous capital. So the idea is, as I've mentioned before, is you take your capital from your cash flow from a project the nation owns and whatever they want to do per year, they'll keep whatever they need for the community and they'll put money towards fund and that fund will be used to, to um, invest into future energy projects or infrastructure projects. And then that money will also go back in and it'll keep growing. So you're creating indigenous sovereign wealth. You're creating an actual indigenous capital to do all the things, the funding we're talking about, the entrepreneurships, the just growing that, that indigenous sovereignty economically to get that reconciliation that we all want to see and achieve. So when you look at that, that indigenous economic sovereignty that we call indigenous sovereign wealth fund is similar to what Norway has done in their sovereign wealth fund, which is now $1.7 trillion as of last year. So you can imagine if we, this, this is where the vision came from for part of reconciliation. Can imagine if 20 or 30 years ago, the nations had equity opportunities to actually take that money and to reinvest it, pool it together. There wouldn't be a need to go to the government saying, where's our you know, loan guarantees? Where's I'm fighting for every scrap right now? And just to move forward. Instead, there would be this growth, this moving forward already together. And it'll create that empowerment and that self-reliance that everybody wants to see. Because once one, once we all rise or one, one person, one population rises, we all end up rising. So that's the idea of the reconciliation is for everyone to rise up, to everyone to benefit, for us all to be together and working to collaboratively towards a better future for all Canadians. So that's just, that's the big picture version of Pride Reconciliation. And the idea was taking an asset like Trans Mountain, which is a huge asset. It's gonna be one of the last ones probably ever built of that size. And the revenue coming off that, using that to build and grow an economic sovereignty for the nations to move forward and to keep growing from. So it's a long-term economic sustain sustainability, not looking for, you know, as much as the industry has changed so much on business opportunities and employment and training, it's only just usually for construction, right? You have the construction window for three to five years or not even that sometimes, and then it's gone. And then the nations or the community or that business is looking for more work every time. With, ec with real equity, not the 5% or 10%, but the 30%, not only do you have a say on what happens with that project, you now have a decent revenue coming off of that to keep growing more projects and programs and growing it and build to invest it elsewhere. That does not hinder the, the money of the community that's already there, that's already limited. There's so many needs right now for not even just 
indigenous or non-indigenous communities, there's just so much needs and there's only so much funding available. And we can't keep giving the funding when there's so many more needs and where's that money gonna come from? So the idea of indigenous sovereignty or I'm using indigenous sovereignty, but <laughs> um, economic reconciliation is to create that self-reliance and, mm -hmm. and the self-governance and just bringing everyone together instead of what we're doing right now is everyone's trying to find a way forward and we're just begging money and hat in hand. And it's just, it's not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. And nobody wants to go out looking for, you know, some money from the federal government and when they don't have to, when they have it their own way and having that, because money, as much as it has the money wounds and all the issues that we're bringing up, it gives you choices and it gives communities choices and it gives people's choices. And so then you have a choice what to do and have a say and be able to develop projects that are not only sustainable economically, but also environmentally and culturally. Because we have these projects coming in. And one thing about PRI or project reconciliation, what we're doing is trying to bring communities in way before the design and engineering is done on a project. So communities can have a say, it's like, okay, well, yeah, this project sounds great, but we don't want it over here because of X, Y, Z cultural values or hunting grounds or because you know, we know the land around Calgary is limited because most of it's private. What can we do? How can we work together on projects? And having a voice at the table, not just revenue at the back end. So that's in a nutshell. And there's so much more nuances to this. And there's so many more differences in the political aspects and the money and how finances work. But that's really what it is. It's about moving it forward. Fantastic. Thanks for, for that introduction, Michelle. And as you say, I'm, I'm sure there's so there's so much more we could we could talk about for, for hours and hours. Um, you know, I, in your response, you talked about um, those money wounds. And then, you know, it made me think about, again, Brenda, you brought up um, money is the new beaver pelt. And um, Brenda, in, in preparation for this event, you shared um, something with us, uh, another metaphor, which is um, tourism is the new Buffalo. And so I would love if you could elaborate on what this means to you and shed some light on the economic, economic shed more light on the economic opportunities that tourism brings to Indigenous communities. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what I must say is the original statement really was education is the new Buffalo, which certainly is a very powerful truth. Um, but within the tourism world, um, we also saw it um, as uh, tourism as the new Buffalo as well for many of us. Um, you know, as as something that is um, really not just slated to feed people, which is a very important part of it, there, there are always many different uses uh, for a buffalo and uh, different aspects to it. And, and the same is for tourism too. Um, it's certainly something that can provide current day opportunities to feed oneself and to uh, to um, have, uh, have better um, economic uh, opportunities as well. But it it delves so much farther than that, too. Um, you know, when I sit down and I think about uh, all of the different uses for a buffalo, for a moose, which are certainly part of some of our teachings and sharings with our, our guests that don't understand the culture very well. Um, I also see it as uh, a broad opportunity to, you know, to to share culture, um, to connect youth and elders, um, to ensure that um, elders are always part of the story as well, and that they benefit uh, economically too. Um, so it is such a, a far reaching um, tool for us to use, um, not only to um, you know, to increase the, the business as aspect for, uh, for entrepreneurs, um, but the creative outlet that it has for us too. And there's so very many different pathways within tourism that we can actually take um, utilizing this, uh, this brand new Buffalo. Um, but also, you know, the respectful nature of it. It's something that we want to caretake. It's something that we do very differently from non-Indigenous operators. We're very different in how we approach tourism. We're very different in how um, how we respectful that we are in terms of, you know, the fact that um, our whole, uh, everything that we share from my family lineage, for example, everything that I share is a really important part of the overall story of Indigenous people within this, within this country. 
So it comes with a great deal of responsibility and respect and always bringing it back to um, utilizing it as, as a way to, uh, um, uh, to create uh, finances or to, to create um, uh, economic buildup within our, you know, within our own, our, our own business and our own reach. I apologize. I've got, uh, got my dog behind me there. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's kind of uh, about as as much as I'll I'll go into. There's so much more I could I could explain on that. But um, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that um, can really help uh, a community tell their own story and uh, for everybody to be involved in it. It's it's a great way for uh, for different families to uh, to also share their own stories and uh, to share that with um, the with uh, people from around the world, not just fellow Canadians, but all over the world. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, to uh, help with uh, truth and reconciliation as well. Oh, I really appreciate that. Um, what you shared around uh, bringing the cultures together and sharing Indigenous cultures with non-Indigenous peoples and sharing those stories and that knowledge and that truth. And, and I actually want to move to a question, another question to, for Shauna about working with uh, non-Indigenous economic development organizations and what success would look like to you when it comes to Community Futures Treaty 7 working with non-Indigenous economic development organizations like our, like CED. Um, and, and what does success look like? Yeah. Um, I guess it goes back to it's 2024 and we need to be good neighbors. Mm. You know, we need to be good neighbors and we need to understand each other and, you know, understand, you know, where, you know, people are coming from. And, you know, as Indigenous people, I think we're pretty good at, you know, at when somebody's approaching us, are they appropriating or are they appreciating? And so on the other side, you know, it's that, you know, if you haven't read the 94 calls to action, you know, have a read of them. And, you know, and then, you know, if you're, if you're Jenny, if you genuinely want to you know, be a good neighbor and get to know, you know, attending, you know, sessions like this and, you know, going to, um, you know, workshops or conferences or whatever, and genuinely getting to know what the communities are all about and learning. Because like I had mentioned before, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, then you'll understand the protocols you'll understand that there's a difference between Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 8 in the province of Alberta. You'll understand that there's, what, 27 different First Nations in Alberta? I think there's 27, or there might be more. I, I even have to figure that out. But, you know, so it's just, it's just, you know, who do you want to be? And, you know, people have, you know, they always ask me, like, you know, what, what is your goal? What, what makes you happy? And my simple answer is I want to be a good ancestor. Plain and simple. That's what I want to be. I want to be a good ancestor, you know, and, and so, you know, just, just, that's what success would be, would mean to me mm -hmm. is just, you know, what be genuine get educated, educate, because then you can walk away and say, hey, you know what, did you know, you know, that, you know, in the province of, you know, Alberta, or even in the, in Treaty 7, there's three different spoken languages. You know, there's the, the, the Dene, which is the Sutina, and then there's the Nakoda, which is the Stonies, and then Blackfoot, which is Blackfoot Confederacy, right? So there's three walk away and you know that. So learning something, learning, you know, being good neighbors, having those teaching moments and sitting there and learning, you know, is, I think that's what success is. And then from that, it leads into other reconciliation to reconciliation. Yeah. Fantastic. No, I really appreciate that answer of just 
you know, the simple, seemingly simple act of, of education and learning um, and showing up authentically and showing up wanting to learn, I think also is, is something that I, I heard you say as well, which I really appreciate. And just being um, a good neighbor. Yeah. 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 Um, Harold, uh, I wanted to ask, um, what are some other ways, you know, you spoke about the Indigenous procurement strategy, but what are some other ways the city of Calgary is advancing reconciliation, both internally at the city and then across, uh, across Calgary? Okay, sure. Yeah, I can answer that. I'll start formally, like with the policy. Um, so we have uh, what we call, um, our, it's our White Goose Flying Report. And I encourage you, if you don't know who Jack White Goose Flying uh, was uh, to to Google the report and to have a read. Um, the the beginning text is is pretty good because really what it is and it describes what I'm about to say is essentially with the White Goose Flying Report is um, our we have an advisory committee to council CAWAC, Cal Calgary Aboriginal Urban Advisory Committee, and so they advise to our city council, and uh, they created. The White Goose Flying Report, and they read the. This was just after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, just after the TRC's report came out. Um, they went through the TRC report, and they they near broke it down into three categories on um, what a municipality can do. Uh, so they made it easy. Um, what a municipality can do to own, support, and to advance the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Um, so out of that, uh, which was written in 2016 by CAWAC, uh, they highlighted of those of those calls that are directly applicable to a municipality or indirectly applicable, that a municipality can action, uh, 43 of them would go to uh, for implementation or to support the implementation of those calls to action. Um, and this year, uh, in September 2024, uh, on September 23rd, 2024, our council is going to have uh, a very first Indigenous focused meeting. Uh, so on that day, and, and this is all news to me, so I found out just as a I was preparing for this panel uh, so I was, I was pleasantly surprised and that so that's one of the things that we'll be doing um, you know and then uh, and then I mentioned in my in my bio is mentioned that uh, I'm project managing the Indian Residential School Memorial Project and so that project we're just gearing up now where we're creating our procurement documents um, so it'll be on the market soon so I can't really tell anyone any more than that than other to watch the to watch uh, to sign up to City of Calgary I put the link to our procurement uh, program their website into into the chat and there's also a link to the Indigenous Relations Office on their site uh, so and there we have an IRO newsletter Indigenous Relations Office newsletter so so we'll be pumping out in addition to all the social media when that procurement is out on the market because we want to have as many people uh, take part as, as possible. I can't really give any more information on that other than we were given a million dollars by City of Council by City of Calgary Council uh, back mm -hmm. upon the first discovery of the ground penetrating radar of the 215 uh, graves in Tecumlup Shewetnik. Um, yeah, and so my mother went to the Labrat Residential School, and and it was uh, she didn't have the best of experiences, and many of those experiences have been transmitted, and I, and I've lived and I lived through them still. Uh, but that said, um, a big part of the of our memorial and that the way we're doing it, and because then there was also discussion of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and how can we do all this stuff, and it's like. I think when it comes to these types of projects, at least in the in the IRS Memorial Project, uh, we want to create a reconciliatory environment, and and so that's pretty much what uh, what happens inside is what happens outside, and and so what that uh, what that means is like so inside we try to really create that reconciliation with all of my colleagues who may who who some of them are non-indigenous, some of them are indigenous, and we really just really say okay we we know the truth and if there if that isn't there then we'll just do some quick education, but it's like okay this is what we're doing this is just how we're going to do it and the and the idea being that if that's part of the project as like as the project um, not just like a standard you know here's your list of project objectives but really to do it in the indigenous way um, 
then that just is going to permeate and it's going to be just part and parcel of the project. So it'll show up in the built form, at least that's the goal. And so to have lofty goals is definitely another part that uh, needs to be part of this, uh, any anybody's reconciliation uh, strategy. Um, so, and then to also talk about the heat map project um, before I take up too much more time. Uh, the heat map project, again, with OCAP. So we engage with a lot of uh, uh, local elders, uh, Treaty 7 area. So the six gate seat the be uh suit in a and uh and uh and metis nation to really say hey what's your traditional knowledge in here and that's where i mentioned ocap is that we're i'm, I'm designing like a, a framework so that we can make sure that we repro like appropriately acknowledge um from these elders and say okay what can be public information so that can be shareable of the traditional knowledge what's the public face of that so that can be shareable and then you know you can say like well if if anybody asks well what's public information It'd be like a sidewalk something that anybody can take to get somewhere and and you know and and really we're I'm really trying to say you know if you have sacred information please keep that because like, and share with us anything that will, that you would say to help to encourage that conversation. And part of our best practices is going to be directing people to those elders, but uh, that'll be, again, it's all a work in progress. So, um, and it's, and it's a big job, actually, it's turning out to be a big job because I think that is a project in and of itself. And I think that's lots there. So. Yes, as you say, it sounds like a lot of work is going on at the City of Calgary, and I really appreciate you sharing all of that um, with us. Really fantastic, fantastic work, and I'm incredibly excited for all of it to see to see all of it when it's uh, when it's complete, and and see how we can continue to work together. So at this point, I'm going to ask the final panel panelist question. Um, you have all been so good at answering the the audience questions. I barely even had to had to raise them um, in this conversation. So that's thank you all so much for your amazing multitasking. Um, so as we wrap up the conversation, what is one message and one action you would encourage the audience um, here today to take away from our conversation? And I'll start with Brenda up at the top of my screen anyway. Well, I would um, highly encourage people to go out and take part in an Indigenous experience. Come come walk with us, as we say at, at uh, Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Come walk with us. Come eat with us. Um, spend time with us. Come learn with us. Um, so I would say uh, engage in an Indigenous experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brenda. Shauna? Well, so um, when you asked me that question, I was actually writing down what I was going to say for the last part. So I guess it's just reiterating, like, just continue to be a good neighbor and go out there and continue to learn and continue to advocate, you know, and and teach, you know, once, you know, once you get to know that, you know, like, you know, what, what my people, you know, are, we're all about my Indigenous, you know, brothers and sisters, what we're all about, you know what, go out there and, and create those spaces, you know, to, to learn, to be, to be good neighbors. And, and thank you to all of those who are, you know, joined in today, you know, and, um, you know, asked questions, listened, you know, you, you genuinely wanted to be here and in this space that was created for the education purposes. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Shauna. Harold. And one more thing. Oh, go yes. Flames, go. go Flames, go. Awesome. Harold. <laughs> well, it's hard to follow up on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as I'm a Flames fan, so I'm, you know, I'm not a Oilers fan or <laughs> anyways um so speaking of challenging this work uh economic reconciliation reconciliation um it's really challenging work uh i said it before um we we kind of got our work if we work in this field we kind of got our work cut out for us like uh we're fighting forces that have been happening at least since 1867 um since this country was created um so it's 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 going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of work. It's really hard. And, um, and the numbers in the report, uh, those baselines, they really show that we still have a lot more work to do. 
Uh, but that said, uh, and this is a shout out to uh, to uh, to my Blackfoot relatives, and uh, and I'll share a word that I found really good because when it was shared with me, I was in a self-induced uh, state of like hunger and thirst, and uh, and they just say uh, and and uh, some of the some of the people there would go around and say igakima igakima, and it means like really like try hard, just really try hard, really go hard. And so um, I was able to, and, and you know, uh, put on a, a bit of weight since then. So, um, you know, I, I'm trying hard. So I, I hope to leave it that with people. So thank you. Oh, that's beautiful, Harold. Thank you so much for sharing that. Michelle. Yeah, thanks. I echo everything everybody said so far. It's, it's about learning. It's about trying hard. Reconciliation is a journey. It's not an overnight thing. It's been something that's long overdue and uh, it's about to happen. But one thing I want to leave with people is that economic, economic reconciliation or reconciliation is a win-win for everyone. It's not just for the nations, it's for everybody. And that's one thing is always people keep thinking it's an us and them mentality. It's not an us and them thing. It is everyone's going to benefit if we all rise up. So I really want to stress that, that it is a win-win for all of Canada. Fantastic. Wow. Gosh, I just got goosebumps from all of the things that all of you just wrapped up and, um, and shared with us. I could continue this discussion all day. And I should say that this discussion has to continue beyond events like this um, so that we can collectively build Harold's future, which I'm going to take from you, Harold, now, where reconciliation is just the way that we do things. A word of thanks as we close out to the entire Calgary Economic Development team, especially our events planning team for making this event possible. It truly takes a village to pull these kinds of events together. It's become a tradition to end each economic or new economy live with a video. And usually it's one of our Calgary Anthem videos. But this time we decided to share a video um, produced by Indigenous Tourism Alberta. Indigenous Tourism Alberta is a nonprofit that supports Indigenous entrepreneurs in the tourism industry. And one thing that almost all members of ITA share is the desire to share their culture, which Brenda spoke a lot about during our event today. And this is why Indigenous experiences are a great opportunity for non-Indigenous people to connect, learn about Indigenous cultures, and start their own reconciliation journeys. And as we've heard today, Indigenous tourism is reconciliation in action, or reconciliation. With that in mind, the video that we'll play now to end off the event is from ITA to make Indigenous experiences, is an invitation, I should say, to make exper Indigenous experiences part of your exploration of Alberta as a way of truly understanding this place. So as we end, I want to thank you all so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming New Economy Live events. And with that, we'll play the video. The applause, everybody. Walk with us, connect to the land that connects us all. Sit with us, sharing our stories and hear our voices. Eat with us, taste the many flavors of our cultures. Grow with us, come together and make space for each other. Laugh with us, smile, joke, and bring each other joy. Dance with us, join in, feel the beat of the drum, and celebrate. Come, walk with us.